exploring ocean floors with Kakanusha Mache. Hello, and welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we'll be exploring ocean floors from Earth out to distant stars. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with Catherine Musameshe, author of Lethal Tides, a new biography telling the story of pioneering oceanographer Mary Sears. Now, Earth is an ocean world with water covering roughly three quarters of the surface of our planet. Now, despite the abundance of oceans around the globe, only a small percentage of the ocean floor has so far been explored. In many ways, surveying ocean floors on Earth is significantly more challenging than studying other worlds. Heading out from land and the relatively shallow waters of the continental shelf, an intrepid diver would come across the abyssal plains. Starting 3,000 meters underwater, the abyssal plains cover 70% of the ocean floor, uh, creating the largest habitat for life anywhere on the planet. However, the lack of sunlight at these depths greatly hinders the diversity of life found there. Rising from these underwater plains, we find the Mid-Ocean Ridge. This chain of submerged volcanoes winding 65,000 kilometers around our global ocean is the largest mountain range in the world. Mount Everest, the tallest mountain on dry land, is easily outdone by Mauna Kea in Hawaii, roughly 1,360 meters taller than Everest as measured from its base. At the other extreme, ocean trenches provide some of the deepest, most mysterious environments anywhere on Earth. The deepest of these is the Mariana Trench near Guam in the Western Pacific Ocean. Now, once upon a time, sunlight was thought to be the ultimate basis for life on Earth. However, if this were the case, life would be nearly non-existent in the deepest part of the oceans. Instead, we find some bizarre life forms calling these cold, dark waters home. Hydrothermal vents, first discovered in 1977, release hydrogen sulfide, the smell of rotten eggs, as well as other chemicals into the water. These ingredients form the chemical basis for chemosynthesis, powering deep sea forms of light. Xenophyophores found in the Mariana Trench are the largest single-celled organism on the face of Earth. These bizarre one-celled creatures can stretch 10 centimeters across the width of a human hand. In 2015, a group of researchers recorded video of a fish living at a depth of nearly 2,500 meters. Since that time, a handful of other fish species have also been found living at similar depths, living in pressures that would crush a human body in an instant. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Our knowledge of the ocean worlds of the solar system and beyond begins with our exploration of the marine environments of Earth. The groundwork of that knowledge was laid out in a very large part by pioneering oceanographer Mary Sears. Next up, we talk with Catherine Messamuche. Her new book, Lethal Tides, explores the life and work of Mary Sears.
This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Catherine Musumeshe. She is the author of a new book, Lethal Tides, which just came out today. It's the story of oceanographer and marine biologist Mary Sears. It uh, just came out from HarperCollins Publishers and is already number one for new releases of History of Biology and Nature on Amazon. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Well, thank you very much, James. Happy to be here. Excellent, excellent. So give us a, can you give us a little bit of insight to who was Mary Sears and what makes her story so interesting? Well, Mary Sears uh, was a marine biologist. And uh, at the uh, beginning of World War II, she was actually out on an ocean expedition off the coast of Peru, because in the United States, women were not allowed on oceanographic expeditions. So she had gone through dangerous waters in the Atlantic, all the way to Peru, so she could get some valuable field experience. And World War II broke out while she was there. And then she came back to the United States where after being initially rejected by the uh, Women's Naval Reserve, she was then recruited to join the uh, United States Hydrographic Office and lead their oceanographic intelligence uh, unit. Hmm. And uh, what is it that drove her to become an oceanographer? What was her what was her origin story? Well, that's such an interesting question because women uh, really did not pursue science uh, at the time that Mary Sears was coming of age in the 1930s. But it just so and she had no initially no plans to to study science, but. Um, she, her mother had tragically died when she was uh, about six years old. Her father remarried a woman who was um, a, a teacher in a private school. And she urged Mary at the time that she went off to college, her stepmother urged her to take at least one science course and broaden her horizons. And once she took one, and, and she happened to take a science course with a marine biologist, and that after that, she said she was hooked and she completely steered herself towards uh, zoology because there wasn't really uh, a marine biology or oceanography major at that time. So she just uh, rearranged her schedule and set her mind to becoming a scientist. Hmm. And she, as I understand it, she um, really specialized in plankton. Plankton, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Why plankton? Well, it just so happened that uh, when Mary Sears, so she um, attended Radcliffe and um, she was not allowed to, which was, you know, the sister school of, of Harvard. And they, the women were not allowed to have full use of libraries, but mm -hmm. she could use like a tiny little room and adjacent to her tiny little room happened to be uh, the world's foremost uh, marine biologist um, nearby. And um, this man uh, took basically noticed how studious uh, Mary Sears was and um, basically offered her a job helping him with his plankton collection that, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, Ocean art, a marine biologists would go out on expeditions and bring back you know, thousands of specimens if they didn't then had to study under the microscope and they needed help with that. So she was the person, his name was Bigelow. She was the person who became Bigelow's uh, right-hand assistant. And from there, um, she would go with him in the summers to Woods Hole, well before the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution had been established, but she would spend the summers in Woods Hole uh, with Bigelow, and then she would uh, go back to Radcliffe and finish her studies and get her PhD during the, during the fall. Wow, so, so interesting. And of course, at the, as you mentioned, at the beginning of the war in the Pacific, 
um, very, the U.S. Navy and well, scientists in general knew very little about the ocean floors. Things were, you know, some maps were hundred year, a hundred years out of date. Um, what? And so they had to learn about the ocean quickly. What is it that attracted them to Mary Sears? What what drew them to her? Well, that's an interesting story in and of itself. Uh, Great. So Mary Mary Sears always said the Navy didn't know how little they knew about the ocean. Um, because you have to remember that in, in the lead up to World War II, everyone was hurrying to get things ready to go to war. And the military, of course, was concentrating on things like, particularly the Navy was concentrating on things like ships and troops and uh, tanks and what they would use to fight the war. They weren't necessarily thinking about, oh, we need to gather some information about where we might, might be likely to go to war, for example, the Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, and even if they had been thinking that, um, there was very little opportunity for them to collect information in such distant regions, many of which were held in, in, under enemy hands. So um, Mary Sears, I, as I mentioned, had initially been rejected. She, right. she came home from, um, when she came home, came back at the start of the war into Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, she was a marine biologist, and most of the people working in the laboratories then were working on things that we would consider physical oceanography, even though that was still a very new concept. So there mm -hmm. were people that were chemists and engineers and people like this and, and some marine biologists. Uh, but people were getting, you know, the, the lab started to empty out because men were going to war. Right. And Mary Sears wanted to go too. Uh, and she applied to what? Well, what is called the waves, which was the women's naval reserve. And she was rejected because she had had a bout of arthritis in the distant past. Mm. So um, she did not think she'd be going to war. But then one day, a person named Roger Ravel showed up in her office. And Roger Re Ravel became a major figure in oceanography after the war. Mm -hmm. He became uh, a director of Scripps Oceanographic institution in San Diego, and he, he is known as one of the major uh, figureheads in, in oceanography. But at that time, um, Ravel was about on the same part. He was actually an, an engineer slash, uh, I, I think, a geologist. And he had come to Woods Hole because he had been assigned uh, to a dual role in the Navy in, D in Washington, D.C., where he would be working in the hydrographic office part time and then part-time working at the Bureau of Ships. And he wanted to be more with the Bureau of Ships, which he saw as the more cutting edge, action-oriented group. And he didn't want to be stuck at the hydrographic office. So he went to Woods Hole to see if he could get one more oceanographer out of these people uh, <laughs> to take his place. Just and one more. <laughs> yeah, just one. Just one. And, uh, you know, he, he sat down with Columbus Iceland, who was the director then of Woods Hole. And you know, I need, I just need one person in Iceland. You know, he said, I don't have anybody. You know, all these people are, we're, we're busy with Navy contracts. I don't have anybody. Um, he said, but, but there is a woman, I guess, you know, you could have her basically. Uh, this is the one expendable person here that we have and you can have her. And so, you know, Ravel went to Mary Sears' office and basically said, hey, I'm, I'm here and uh, I'm, I'm going to get you into the Navy. And and she's like, OK, well, we'll see how that goes, because I've already been turned down once. Mm -hmm. But Ravel went back to Washington and, and met with people and, and uh, met with the director of the hydrographic office. And he managed to get Mary Sears a, a medical waiver. So she it's not like they went looking specifically for her. Right. And in fact, I would say that some people might have actually underestimated her initially that, you know, the idea was, well, somebody needs to take on this boring job at the, uh, in the Naval Hydrographic Office, not knowing that um, it would turn into a major job 
and uh, that Mary Sears would find herself leading uh, a very key uh, unit that collected oceanographic intelligence um, to support the, this major uh, Pacific campaign of World War II. And can you tell us a little bit about the, about her work, her studies, some of the findings she made, some of the discoveries that happened because of because of Mary Sears? Uh, sure. And I uh, just want to point out, it, initially, Mary was working by herself. But mm. eventually, um, of course, she needed to recruit some other people. And uh, I think the best way to point out or emphasize exactly how important their work was, and it was Mary Sears, uh, the planktonologist, and and when I when I you know recite this description of these people, I mean these are not who you would typically think of as naval intelligence officers, but this is who these are the people that arrived and that uh, fulfilled the mission. So it was Mary Sears, a planktonologist, and Fenner Chase, who studied crustaceans, particularly hermit crabs. That was his mm -hmm. specialty, <laughs> and it was Dora Henry who was a barnacle specialist. And then Mary Greer, who had been investigated by uh, the FBI for alleged communist ties, she was the nation's foremost oceanographic librarian. Mm -hmm. So these four people working together uh, were able to, basically they weren't conducting experiments or anything. They were, they were like intelligence officers trying to find information from any source they could um, many times it was libraries. Um, and what was interesting is the Japanese, and, and of course they needed a lot of information about Japanese islands. Right. Uh, Japanese had, if people don't realize Emperor Hirohito was actually a marine biologist in his background. Hmm. And he had funded all these survey missions around uh, Japan and islands. And, and then they had published all this information before the war. So part of their uh, findings would be going around and finding publications in Japanese and having them translated. And, and in some ways it almost seems too easy that some of the things they needed like uh, information about tides and waves and, and currents and ocean se sediments and all these other things, they just went and got it off the shelf. But right. in many cases they did exactly that. And, um, they included them, well, let, let me just back up a little bit. So to know how important their work, uh, one might need to know uh, basically that uh, the uh, this Battle of Tarawa and the Battle of Tarawa, it was one of the first major uh, invasions uh, of the Pacific campaign. It, there had been a, a couple before that, but Tarawa was a super big one. And what happened there was that the tides were misjudged. And because the tides were misjudged and, and they had to cross a coral reef, the landing boats could not get across the, the coral reef. And this landing was taking place. It was an opposed landing. So the Japanese were firing on the Americans as they were trying to land. And they were stranded on this coral reef because instead of getting the five feet they needed, they only got 3.5. And so, you know, American, the Marines had to, had to bail out and just, you know, wade towards shore. And they, because of this, there was just an ungodly number of casualties that in the end created a major uh, uh, public relations disaster for right. the Navy. So after that, although it was nothing said overtly, after that, it seemed that the role of oceanographic intelligence was elevated and took on more importance. And Sears and Mary Sears and her cohorts were, um, they were responsible for compiling a chapter of these intelligence reports called Joint uh, Army-Navy Intelligence Studies for the Joint Chiefs. So their work was being utilized at the highest levels of war planning uh, to assist the Joint Chiefs in, in determining you know, where and when to invade a particular 
island or region in the Pacific, but mm. they were also being excer excerpted for operations planners. So they're being used all down the chain of, of command mm. uh, by different other uh, war planners. So, you know, the war planning <laughs> takes place from the Joint Chiefs strategic level all the way down to, you know, the, the operations planning that's going to take take place on the day, on the day of the invasion. So they're, they were being used for that also. Hmm. And uh, now you can tell us just briefly a little bit about uh, Mary Sears' work with the Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, Institute and, the, and how she helped develop that. Oh, yeah. Well, Sears, after the war, she returned to Woods Hole and spent her entire career at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. <clears throat> and of course, she was still prohibited from going out on uh, research expeditions. Mm -hmm. um, and so she sort of pivoted to uh, a role where she, um, you know, served as an editor and uh, an organizer of information for the field of oceanography. And she uh, co-edited uh, the first major oceanographic journal, Deep Sea Research. And she helped bring all the people together. I, she also coordinated the first international conference on oceanography that was held in New York in the 1950s. And so she just kind of turned to this role where she collected information, much like she was doing in World War II, uh, but all information in oceanography. And she compiled a 15 volume, and it's these oversized volumes, giant books. I should have brought one here to show you, but I have a couple of, of, hmm. of these index cards. She collected over 250,000 index cards <sighs> Yes. Wow. Because, you know, this is before there were computers. Right, right. So these volumes were all cross-referenced and indexed and, and everything. So that Mary Sears really became the repository of knowledge for the field of oceanography. And, uh, you know, kind of set the tone for, you know, how this, how things should go, go forward mm -hmm. in the field. And she helped professionalize oceanography as a specialty. Wow. And speaking of huge repositories of knowledge, what inspired you to write this, this book full of knowledge about Mary Sears? Mary Sears, yeah. I, you know, I had written, you know, this is my third book. And uh, my second book, I had, which was a history of, uh, of trauma care, I had written a lot about um, different wars because injury, you know, it, and, and trauma care is, uh, sort of branched out from wars because before we had wars, uh, I mean, once we, when we had wars, we had injuries. Mm -hmm. And then when we had cars, when we got cars, we had more injuries, but most of trauma care came from actually wars. And I knew I wanted to write something that had to do, you know, I had discovered just all this interesting information about World War II. And I, I thought, you know, I want to do something about World War II. And I was looking around for an idea and um, I was actually researching someone and I came across Mary Sears' story in this, in this book I was reading. It was just, you know, a chapter about her. And I was like, this is just amazing what she has done. Mm -hmm. uh, it was truly, truly amazing. And I had recently taken my father's oral history. He had, he had been in World War II as a 17-year-old sailor and mm -hmm. he had he had been at these some of these major invasions like Okinawa and Peleliu and uh, invasions in the Philippines where Mary Sears had provided um, intelligence reports. So I was really interested um, in exploring that further. And that's, that's how I decided to write this. Hmm. And finally, um, where can people get more information about this brand new book and where can they buy themselves a copy? Oh, well, uh, first of all, the, my website, katherinemusamichi.com, or it's also lethaltides.com has all the information about the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can buy the book anywhere that uh, 
you know, books are sold, but uh, of course, Amazon and Barnes and Noble uh, here in Austin, book people and book women. All right, fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Catherine. It was great talking with you. Well, James, I appreciate you having me and um, uh, just thank you for everything you do for, for science and particularly women in science. Thank you. And that was Catherine Yusmeshe, uh, author of Lethal Tides, just out today from HarperCollins Publishers. Check it out. Now, despite our marvelous water world, our planet is far from the only place in the solar system where we find oceans. Four large moons orbit Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. While Io is a volcanic world, the other three moons are thought to house enormous oceans. Europa is likely home to vast oceans of liquid water beneath its smooth, frozen surface. Billions of years old, the oceans of Europa might be ten times deeper than the oceans of Earth, holding twice as much water as our own world. The Europa Clipper, a spacecraft designed with the goal of searching for signs of habitable conditions on that moon, now readies for launch in 2024. Callisto could hold on to nearly five times as much water as Earth, and even that is dwarfed by over 35 billion cubic kilometers of water thought to be a, thought to be on Ganymede. That's enough water to fill over 173,000 billion billion of those little Dixie cups. Saturn has its own motley group of watery cohorts, including Enceladus, a prime target in the search for life. Titan, known to hold large lakes of methane and ethane at its surface, might also hold a storehouse of water beneath its crust. In the coming decades, we may have a chance to glimpse ocean floors underlying alien oceans of our solar system. The ocean floors of distant exoplanets, however, will likely lay well beyond our reach for the immediate future. However, we may still be able to sense the presence of extraterrestrial life on the ocean floors of alien worlds. Spectrographic analysis by instruments including the James Webb Space Telescope could provide this first tantalizing evidence. Join us next week on the Cosmic Companion. We'll be looking at Earth. What a weird planet! As we talk with Catherine Williams, editor of Weird But True, World 2023 from National Geographic. Make sure to join us starting on the 30th of August. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, like, share, do any of those social media type things. You know the things I'm talking about. Clear skies. (laughs) 